It's coal versus COP24. Can a new round of UN climate talks make progress in the fight against carbon? I'm Imran Garbda and today's newsmaker is Poland's Climate Change Summit. 200 countries have come together to save the planet as leaders meet at the biggest climate change summit since the Paris Agreement was signed three years ago. The aim is to stop the world from warming by two degrees Celsius to prevent an environmental catastrophe. But if you need evidence of mounting resistance, the delegates are meeting in the city of Katowice, in the heart of Poland's coal country. And the hosts aren't the only skeptics. China wants developing nations held to looser standards, standards that are already voluntary. And the U.S. is expected to push what it calls clean coal. Scientists have already described the Paris Accord as mission impossible. So is there any chance of success at these talks? Our correspondent Sandra Gatman was there and spent time in the country's richest coal mining region to understand why Poland is digging in its heels. Right now, we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Our greatest threat in thousands of years. Climate change is running faster than we are. This is already a matter of life or death. The warnings are stark. Experts say that to save our planet, the world needs to stop using coal by 2050. They're drafting ambitious plans to make that happen at this year's COP24 climate conference in Poland. But in an ironic twist, the host country isn't ready to let go. Pełnie w Polsce urząd prezydenta nie pozwolę na to, aby ktokolwiek zamordował polskie górnictwo. Bo z wielką. Giving up coal has not been easy for Poland. It powers the economy. More than 80% of its electricity comes from coal, and that number used to be even higher. Over the years, Poland has closed down dozens of mines in Lower Silesia. Unemployment soared, and some towns have struggled to recover. In the mid-90s, Wabrich's three mines closed overnight. Roman worked in one of them, and he's still out of a job. I myślę, że na górnym Śląsku, gdyby teraz zamknięto kopalnie, to stałoby się tak samo jak u nas. Zaczęłoby się w jedno wielkie bezrobocie, jedny wielki szum. Myślę, że wielkie manifestacje, strajki, no bo nie sposób jest wiele tysięcy ludzi, wiele tysiącom ludzi dać w jednym dniu pracę. But with so much coal still left in the ground, some miners haven't given up. Tu jest dziura, tam jest później chodnik, to idzie w tamtą stronę. They've been digging on this hillside illegally. You can see why coal is so treasured in these parts. It's so easy to dig it out of the ground. Some people question why digging shafts like this and extracting coal is considered illegal because it's something so natural to people. It's like gathering wood. Roman wanted to show us just how easy it is. To, żeby trochę wydobyć, trochę zarobić, głównie na op na opał. Coraz to niżej, coraz to dalej się po prostu postępuje, żeby zdobyć, wydrzeć z ziemi bogactwo, które tutaj jest, czyli czarne złoto. To jest nazywane czarnym złotem. Elegancki. Poland's coal industry is shrinking, but still powerful. It employs nearly 400,000 people. A new mine is scheduled to open next year. 
the unions uh, are um, a very important uh, part of the picture and uh, the mines itself and uh, this whole industry is a very big um, lobbying uh, party. It's a country where change is perceived as a chance for a better future. Coal companies even sponsored this year's climate talks, championing the catchphrase, just transition, code for protecting jobs. For Polish miners, that means the party isn't over. This week, they've been celebrating Saint Barborka, their patron saint who they believe keeps them safe underground. Right now, these men really do feel protected. Święta Górnika, dlatego że bardzo cenimy to, co mamy, doceniamy to, co mamy. Przede wszystkim pracę, bezpieczeństwo i możliwość utrzymania naszych rodzin. Off camera, some miners told us they don't believe in climate change. Others say coal allows Poland to be self-reliant, not dependent on Russia for energy. And for many, the attachment to mining is something more. Mundur w Polsce zawsze był Szanowany mundur wojskowego, mundur górnika i zgodnie z polskim za mundurem pan Myszturę. But the people of Poland are already suffering the consequences of burning coal. They breathe some of the worst air in Europe. In the winter time, in Poland in general, air pollution is linked with uh, burning solid fuels uh, in domestic boilers. And when you go outside, you just smell it. So actually last year in uh, January, more people were hospitalized than normally because of the uh, air pollution. It's not just asthma, but also cancer, stroke can be linked to, to air pollution. Awareness is growing. A recent survey found that eight out of 10 Poles want cleaner energy. In Krakow, years of pressure on city officials has led to a first ever ban on domestic coal stoves. Thanks to our campaign uh, in uh, September 2019, that will be the, the last month of, of burning solid fuels. These days, Roman goes everywhere with a camera. Staram się tradycje górnicze, czyli biesiady górnicze, barburki, utrwalać coś, co kiedyś będzie jakimś kawałkiem historii. He knows change is coming. He's lived it. Marsz, marsz. But old habits die hard. Sandra Gatman, the newsmakers, Silesia, Poland. Well, to discuss this, we're joined in Warsaw by Dominik Tarczynski. He's a Polish MP with the ruling Law and Justice Party in Washington, D.C. We have Mark Morano. He's the executive director of Climate Depot, a website that disputes the scientific consensus on climate change. And finally, in Katowice, Poland, is James Ellsmore. He's the founder of the group Solar Head of State, which works with governments to promote renewable energy. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. James, let me begin with you. There are people who see this conference as the most important since the Paris 2015 conference. Do you agree with that? Well, this conference is all about setting out the rule book for how we implement the Paris Agreement. And I think um, it's unfortunate that we've seen such a drive towards uh, non-renewable energy in this conference. I think there's a very important change that we saw since last year with Fiji chairing towards this year with Poland. And I think it's very important, important in the sense that the leadership around this conference is perhaps not as strong as it was last year. And that is very challenging for future negotiations. Tell me why it's not as strong, James. Well, Fiji is a small island developing state is particularly vulnerable to the risk of climate change. Um, we've seen hurricanes there year after year, and uh, there's a worry that these are only going to get worse and be combined with rising sea levels. And they were really representing the rest of the Pacific Islands um, and calling for strict cuts and a move away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, as well as climate finance to address the impact of climate change for um, low-income countries. Now, in, in the Polish case, um, we're in a country that is 80%, 80% um, of the electricity is generated by coal, 
and there are very different. Uh, there's a very different rationale of how we should deal deal with climate change than we saw from the future. Yeah, President Duda refusing to abandon coal says it does not contradict the protection of the climate. Dominic Tarchinsky, that's your government's position. You're hosting the conference. You must be proud to host the conference. Is it easy to square what seems to be two contradictory intentions, protecting the environment, but also not wanting to gut a crucial driver of your economy? Yeah, obviously. I'm very proud that this conference is taking place in Poland, which proves that we really take care about our environment, that pollution is a very serious problem, and we are taking steps to get rid of pollution. And very important thing is that these contradictions which you mentioned, we can cope with that. First of all, our government started very important reform, which is called Clear Air. We're going to spend 3 billion euros for over 1,000 buses, electrical, electrical buses. Then we, we, we are going to spend 250 million euros for new technology heaters in the private houses. We're going to mm -hmm. support those who will be happy to exchange the old technology for, for the new one. And very important thing, I'd like to show you specific data, which is important to our discussion, about polluters in Europe. This is very important. Germany, 23%. Great Britain, 11.2%. Yeah, we can't, then you've got yeah, we Italy, can't fully see that actually. I mean, 10%. You can tell and us we can't fully Poland. see that. Yeah, yeah. Certainly. Certainly. We can't fully see it because it's too far away, but we we'll take your word it's, for it. It's, yeah. it's official data. You can, you can, yeah. you can Google it. It's, it's, what I'm trying to say is that Poland is not a biggest polluter, mm -hmm. as someone says, or trying to put the words into the mouth. Great Britain, Italy, um, uh, France. This is very important. So why I'm saying that? Because we need someone to cooperate. We need right. people to make these very important decisions together. We cannot have any kind of hypocrisy. And when you look at the history, because the pollution is a very, uh, a very serious issue, but this is political, historical, and economical issue. When you go through the history and you see Germans, not, I'm not talking about Second World War II only, but 17, 18, 19th century, and see, and you see, you see Russians all these days how they. Uh, reacted, how they treated Poland, we have to fight for our security with the energy. That's why Understood. we will never, ever stop uh, our safety. And at the moment, our uh, black gold is the coal. So when we have Germany, you know, building Nord Stream 2, when we have France selling uh, warships, mistrals to Russia. We have to think about our security. Obviously, as I said, environment is very important for us. Right. I want my son and grandson to be healthy, to be happy with a beautiful environment. But we have to be responsible for the next generation and the safety of our nation. Yeah, let me bring in Mark Morano. So, Mark, interestingly, Dominic talks about not wanting to have pollution. There are those who agree with the scientific consensus who believe that beyond just actual pollution of the air, the burning of the fossil fuel coal leads to global warming. I guess that's what you would dispute. Do you accept the consensus that this conference marked that everybody's working towards lessening the burning of fossil fuels so that global warming also stops by 2050? No, I don't accept that consensus. And first of all, I'll be heading to Poland in a few days and I'll be there all next week. What Dominic said is exactly right. First of all, let's distinguish between actual pollution and carbon dioxide emissions. And yes, there's all kinds of technology and improvement and infrastructure development you can do to improve the results of coal burning to clean up your air. And Poland is doing that. But in terms of what Dominic just said about the history of Poland, yeah. to be dominated by Germany, then decades under the Soviet Union, all they've done now is essentially replaced a new regulatory body that's come in, and it's going to be the EU and the UN telling Poland how they can do their energy mix. 79% of Poland is coal miners. It's one of the most revered institutions. Polling shows that pol mine workers are considered higher, the highest, you know, most respected uh, citizens in the country. This is part of Polish nationalism. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. And what I would say to Dominic, what I would say to Poland is join President Trump, join Brazil, join these other countries that are taking a hard look and start this looking is what at a we way want. out we respect of this Donald UN Trump. mess, I which think can Donald only hurt Trump Poland. is very right. Okay, so let me bring in James here because Thank you. something that's interesting here, but right? What and I'm trying to say, hold on, hold on, Dominic, European just a Union and UN, certainly. we are the part of this family. Okay, you are a part of this family. And something that's interesting here, we've heard it from other countries as well. They're saying 
rich industrialized countries. You guys polluted the environment. You guys contributed to global warming while you industrialized. And now you're asking us to also shoulder the burden as we all get together. But hold on, why, why is it so imbalanced, right? That's, that's fundamentally one of the issues politically. But beyond that, James, let me bring you in here. Because what we're hearing from Mark and what we're hearing from Dominic as well is that they're sure about the fact that burning something like coal makes the air dirty, but they're not so sure about the other thing, which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says, is that if we don't stop burning coal as a fossil fuel, if we don't do it by 97% by 2015, we won't be able to limit global warming by 1.5%. So, James, how do you deal with the fact that fundamentally people believe very different things when it comes to why you should stop using coal as a fossil fuel? Well, absolutely. I think we can all accept air quality is a serious issue here in Silesia, Katowice, where we are. Um, in parts of the region this week, the, uh, the air quality has been reaching a critical state. Um, the equivalent of being outside to smoking 10 to 20 cigarettes a day, depending on where you are. So we can all agree that that is an important reason to reduce coal. And I, I reject the claims that the Polish government is moving uh, quickly on climate change. They currently, as I said, use 80% of electricity coming from coal. They're only going to reduce that to 50% by 2050, and that's just not enough that we need. But I'd also, I'd also completely agree that we need further action from Germany, from the UK, uh, from, from France. I mean, I'm not here just to criticize Poland. I realize Poland is in a difficult position, and I fully appreciate the uh, difficulty for miners and traditional mining regions that we'll have um, in this country during the transition. But the reality is the current Polish government is saying there's 200 years of coal uh, left in the ground, and that's just not true if you want to do justice for the miners living in this country. You need to prepare for that transition, prepare for a move away from coal, and actually renewable energy for places like Poland right. in the longer period is going to make economic sense. Okay, so Dominic, are you preparing for renewable energy and alternatives? I mean, it's not a, it's not a law of nature that you have to burn coal forever and ever, right? Well, we are very open for the dialogue. We are very open for the new technology. As I said, this 3 billion, do uh, 3 billion euros, which will be spent for the over a thousand elect electrical buses is just to prove that we are the one of the few countries in, in Europe which really does change and we really care. So then we've got over 250 million euros for this um, more, more um, advanced uh, heaters. So we are open for, for, for the green energy, uh, but it doesn't mean that we have to resign from our black gold. It's very important because, as I said, I'm trying to look on the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's important about, because of the uh, safety, security. Look at Ukraine. Ukraine was promised that, that if they will give away the nuclear power, the integrity of the country will be safe. And look what's, what, what is happening now. Russia is attacking. So we need to have um, people who, who have credibility and we need to have a partners who really want to do the change. Show me one country in Europe which is doing as much as we do. What about China? What about other partners? And again, UN is us. We are the part of UN. European Union is us. We are the part of the European Union and we are equal like everyone else. So it's not like that someone is going to tell us or others what to do and how to do it. Mm -hmm. We can discuss it as a partners. We can take your advance, uh, advices, but you know, we, we are not owned by anyone. As I, again, don't get me wrong. We really love our children. We love our families. All of us are aware of this problem. This is a very serious problem. Uh, but we have to do it step by step, keeping in mind uh, who is our neighbor? I'm talking about Poland. We've got Germany, which is the, the biggest polluter, and we've got, uh, we've got Russians who are doing the deal with Nord Stream 2. Energy is the way to take over power very often. So it's, uh, it's not only about health, it's not, it's not about quality of air only, but about the, the, the security, about the safety the, of the whole nation. Mark Morano, moving away from... Oh, okay, James, you want to jump in? Jump in. Come in. Importing, um, importing coal from other countries. And so renewable energy, I think this is often left out of the conversation, that renewable energy is a very important way for countries to achieve um, energy security. And uh, for Poland to increase the amount of renewable energy that it's doing would be very valuable for its actual uh, security, as it would be in the United States and other countries. I don't want this to be all fingers pointed to Poland, because of course, you know, this needs to be a global effort, and Poland is just one part of that. But they are chairing this conference, and so they have a huge influence mm -hmm. over any decisions that happen this week. Mark, you want to come in? 
Yes, I just want to say here, the, the key here is that, yes, uh, you can have and make a foray into tr uh, renewable energy, but you can't ban energy that works, oil, gas, coal, and mandate energy that's not ready. And if it is ready, then fine, let it take over. Why do you have to ban all the energy that's proven but it isn't itself a ban. successful? But Mark, and it isn't James's a ban. Point, uh, well, hold Mark, on, one point. Mark, the true. Polish coal What's companies that? are sponsoring this conference. You think they would I'm sponsor talking something about, that I'm talking about the UN goals. Well, the UN climate chief has said they seek a centralized transformation. They talk about a two degree goal at 1.5. If you look at the climate gate emails from the scandal, <laughs> the top UN scientists admitted these numbers were pulled from thin air. This is a political move to give central planning to a few bu key bureaucrats in the EU and the United Nations to micromanage all these countries. Poland doesn't deserve that. The, U the EU wants to give Poland $1.5 billion to ease the transition as they put lay off coal workers. As assuming Poland follows these UN edicts and, and goals from the UN Paris Agreement. But I would argue if Poland can reject that money, reject these goals, do what's best for Poland. That is the problem here, is that we don't need, Poland does not need to That's cede right. sovereignty over to the EU, to the United yeah. Nations. And I stand with Dominic here and I, I ask you to Poland to stay strong, take a page from the United States and other countries that are following suit. Okay, although Dominic, unlike Mark, you don't reject that climate change is going on, right? You accept that it's going on. You accept it's a problem, right, Dominic? It's it's all about it's all about var various uh, opinion of of the people who are you know working on it, scientists. <laughs> Uh, I can tell that we've got a problem in, in some of the Polish cities like anyone else. But again, we are not the biggest polluter. Uh, the Germany is over 23 percent, Great Britain, France, Italy. And then you've got somewhere Poland uh, in the end. But the, the, the whole discussion, it's not about Poland itself. Obviously, again, I'm very proud that this summit is taking place in, in Poland. But the, the, the whole problem is, is worldwide. It, it is a kind of crisis because of uh, lack of decisions. You know, uh, the, the uh, decisions and the declarations from Paris was not full, were not fulfilled. So again, it, it's about credibility of our partners. That's why I do agree with President Trump, step by step, but do not give away your uh, sovereignty and, and your own safety. So, uh, you know, apart from the healthy part of, of pollution, uh, I mean, unhealthy, and then, then uh, medical problems and issues, there is a political and economical war. There are many countries which would be very happy to get rid of coal in Poland and other countries. We are aware of that. That's why, yeah. A, we're going to fight with the pollution. B, we're going to spend as much as we can. C, we are already spending the most in European Union. So, you know, take example from Poland, uh, spend at least the same money, even though we are having uh, less money in our budget, and, and then we can talk as a partners. Again, 3 billion euros for over a thousand buses, electronic buses, that's just for the mm -hmm. beginning, and then 250 million euros for, for the heaters in the private homes. This is what we already started. So please, take example from Poland. Okay, it's been a fascinating intersection of different ideas especially given the fact that this conference has been happening in Katowice, the capital of the Silesian mining district in Poland. Gentlemen, I appreciate you Which taking proves the time. that we are open for the discussion. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad you, you came onto the show and you were open for Thank discussion you. here as well. James Ellsmore, Mark Morano, and Dominic Tarczynski. I've got to move on. Those are come, we look at the rise of the far right in Spain as the Vox Party enters the regional parliament. Should Spaniards fear a return to fascism? And is the ASEAN bloc ignoring the plight of the Rohingya? We ask why it refuses to condemn what increasing numbers of groups recognize as genocide. Local elections in southern Spain produced a shock result with the far-right party Vox claiming dozens of seats in Andalusia's regional parliament. Critics call Vox anti-immigrant, anti-feminist and anti-environment. That's in stark contrast to the socialist-run federal government, which has welcomed Syrian refugees and paved the way for a dramatic plan to reduce carbon emissions. So, is one of Europe's most progressive countries facing a conservative backlash? Randolph Nogel reports. It's a phenomenon spreading across Europe. 
Yet in Spain, few saw it coming. The rise of far-right party Vox, which has capitalized on a popular political theme, taking back the country for its citizens. Andalusians once again have made history as many times in the past. They have shaken off 36 years of socialist regimes, marking the way for the rest of the Spanish people by saying that it is possible and even easier to do the same in the rest of the country. The results of the election in Andalusia, Spain's most populous region, is part of a broader political fragmentation in the country. For years, a political duopoly existed. Those on the left voted for the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party, those on the right, the People's Party. Only recently have the center-right Ciudadanos, or Citizens' Party, and the far-left Podemos' Party entered Spanish politics. Now Vox has found space on the far right, an indication, perhaps, of a shift in Spanish society. This campaign video shows Vox's leader, Santiago Abascal, leading followers across a landscape in southern Spain. It ran with the caption, the reconquest will begin on the soil of Andalusia, a reference to the long struggle to end centuries of Muslim rule that spread from North Africa. Vox has benefited from people's concern over illegal migration. Spain saw more migrants arriving in 2018 than the prior three years combined. Andalusia, the southernmost region, is on the front line. Vox's anti-immigration policies, which include deporting all illegal immigrants, and repatriating any immigrant convicted of a crime clearly resonated with voters. The far-right party was widely expected to get 1 to 2 percent of the regional vote. Instead, it got 11 percent. But its staunch opposition to Catalan independence is also seen as part of the party's growing appeal. The issue has elevated nationalism, which Vox champions, in a country where people often have identified with their region before the nation. And while Vox describes itself as a party of extreme necessity, many Spaniards strongly oppose its ideas, which for some evoke bitter memories of life under dictator Francisco Franco. Whether what has taken place in Andalusia is an isolated incident or an indication of national headwinds is so far unclear. But municipal, regional, and European elections in May could provide further clues as to whether Vox is a momentary aberration or an enduring national movement. Randolph Nogle, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, we have Vox National Bureau member Ivan Espinoso de los Monteros. He joins us from Asturias, Spain. In Barcelona, we have political analyst and author Elizabeth Castro. And in Madrid, we have Luis Arroyo, who is an advisor to former socialist prime minister Zapatero. Thanks for joining us, all of you. Ivan, let me start with you. So I'm reading in the press, that this group of people got 12 seats in the Andalusian parliament. They want Franco's Spain back. They're fascists. Is that the truth? Are you fascists? Uh, I think you're reading the wrong sort of paper. Uh, nothing similar to what you're saying. Fox is a very uh, reasonable party. It's a new party. It promotes things that uh, I think most people would agree with. It's a catch-all party. Uh, we have voters coming from different parts of uh, the political spectrum. And the things we defend are so common standard, so common sense, such as depending uh, freedom, national unity, smaller governments, uh, lower taxes. Uh, we defend the security of our borders. Uh, we uh, defend law and order. We defend our national sovereignty, as opposed to those who want to dilute um, Spain into the EU and other nations. I think these are very common sense issues. Uh, if they weren't, we probably wouldn't be having the sort mm -hmm. of response we are having. Okay, Elizabeth Castro, common sense issues, nothing to worry about. What do you think? I would look a little bit more closely at the origins of, of Vox, um, starting with their uh, their leader, Abascal, who was a member of the PP from 1994, till, 1994 until 2013, before he started Vox. Um, the PP itself was founded by a former minister of under Franco. Um, the kinds of policies that they support are things like eliminating Catalan autonomous government, uh, illegalizing parties and democratic parties that are in favor of independence, and eliminating organizations that are in favor of independence uh, through democratic means, eliminating the Catalan police, eliminating the Basque uh, agreement on finance, 
protecting, overprotecting Spanish symbols, the language, the royalty, um, policies, anti-women policies, anti-homosexual uh, policies, extremely hard on uh, immigration, on refugees. They're interested in building walls. This is the kind of uh, policies that you see in Trump's America. This is right. um, exclusionary. We want to keep everybody out. This is highly nationalist. Uh, hard right rhetoric. Okay, so Ivan, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to that in a moment. But first, I want to ask Luis. Luis, for those of us, especially on this show, on this channel, we've followed Catalonia very, very closely. Is this one of the symptoms of what happened over the past couple of years in Spain, where you have a region like Andalusia, they see what happened in Catalonia, and they don't want that to happen. So people are clinging more to these Spanish symbols and the Spanish identity because they don't want people to break away or attempt to break away. Uh, Catalonia is no doubt uh, one of the factors, but th there are many others. There, there's the factor of the economic crisis, no doubt. There's the factor uh, also of the uh, immigration. Uh, let's remind uh, that Vox is extremely anti-immigration. Uh, there's the factor of the rise of the far right, of the extreme right in Europe, that uh, also reflects the tendency in Spain. So there are many factors. Uh, Catalonia is one of them, but not, but but it's not the only one. Okay, and what's the main one then, Luis? I wouldn't say that there's there's one very important one, but I would say that the very uh, the very moderate policies from the uh, Popular Party uh, made m some part of the electorate to be uh, uncontent with uh, with uh, with the Popular Party. We thought that Spain was an exception in Europe that we ha we, we did not have the extreme right in our parliaments, and we realized uh, that the Popular Party left a certain space, which is not majoritarian yet uh, at all. Uh, it's minoritarian, still minoritarian. But that has a space. But I want to make clear um, that that they, they 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 are the far right. I mean, right. Ivan can say whatever they want. They they <laughs> they will never call them themselves. I know Ivan pretty well, and I know that if I have the conversation with him, he would never say it in public. But they okay. are the far right. They are farther than the PP. They are uh, a, a brother or a sister of other uh, extreme right parties in Europe, they are exactly the same, the same thing. Okay. Uh, we mentioned already Trump, but it's basically the same thing. Okay, so, Ivan, the fact that the first person in politics across the continent to call you and congratulate you was Marine Le Pen from France, from Front National, doesn't that tell us all we need to know? I think you're assuming things that are completely wrong. He, she was not the first. Uh, there were many others. We have had contact with every single... Uh, politician and party in Europe, from the Conservative Party in the UK, the Republican Party in the United States. Uh, we have contacts in Australia. We, we have contacts everywhere in the world. But it, it's it's sort of funny to hear uh, separatists and, and people who have advised Zapatero, who has been uh, a tragic president for Spain, saying that we are on the far right. Of course, Spain is different. Luis Arroyo was saying that we thought Spain was different. Spain was the exception uh, in the sense that the far left has been governing Spain since 2004. They've been able to do something that nobody the else has, left, which is sorry. to take Zapatero everybody the left. to the left. Sorry, Ivan. And, and the, 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 the left. I, I, I've been sure. trying to be respectful for, with you, and I think you're showing both of you. No, no, I'm very respectful. You, you don't even no, let no, me. No. You're not even leaving, okay, leaving me the option point, to Ivan. speak. Go ahead. That's how, no that's how radical no, no, you no two are. Can so we have the radical left, and we have the radical separatists. Now, we know what separatism and nationalism has done in Europe for many, many years. Uh, unfortunately, we have very good memory about what the 1940s looked like with the rise of nationalism in Europe. Now, what Liz Castro represents, excuse me, uh, Elizabeth Castro represents, is exactly that. We, she represents the nationalistic, racist, uh, separatist, extremist views that okay. have brought lots of lots of pain. Okay, uh, so to let's Europe. ask Elizabeth. We're, all okay. we're saying, uh, hold on, Ivan. Well, if I might finish my point, then. The only thing that we're defending is the unity mm -hmm. of our nation, which I'm sure that anybody would defend, okay, so would defend any Elizabeth. single nation. If I were to ask you in Turkey, do you defend the unity of your nation? I don't think you would uh, be against that. So Elizabeth. there's really nothing radical except the nationalists and separatists that are in Catalonia. Elizabeth, and Elizabeth, Ivan, Ivan's not the extremist. Okay, Ivan, if Ivan's not the extremist, you are. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if Yvonne was ever going to, to uh, cede the space. Um, I, and it would seem that it would be very interesting to look not to the 40s in Spain, but to the 30s, to look at what nationalism did in this country particularly. Uh, the scourge of Franco has not been erased, unfortunately. Um, 
the couple on the independence movement is a hugely successful, massive, democratic, grassroots, progressive movement. It was here in Catalonia <laughs> that we had the largest rally in favor of welcoming yeah. refugees in Europe. Um, there have been no uh, congratulations. In fact, the the communication that Vox has gotten from the uh, Marine Le Pen, from David Duke, one of the, the Ku Klux Klan people in the United States, um, those aren't contacts. Those are congratulations. The, I, I'm, I'm surprised Trump didn't, didn't uh, congratulate you as well. You're a clear um, representation of exclusionary nationalistic flag waving that you could never pin on Catalonia, even though you would like to. What's going on in Catalonia <laughs> is a self-determination movement that is based in yeah. democracy and in right. listening to all of the different views. For the record, um, okay, certainly. So for the record, I spoke to Mr. Zapatero and he was against Catalonia breaking away. I had a conversation with him, so he wasn't exactly extreme left and separatist when I spoke to him. Luis, as we look yeah. at how no. this plays out in Spain, Today, So you have a federal government which is left-wing and you have more power for the far right within a place like Andalusia. What is that going to mean for the region specifically? Tell me. Who knows, but probably is that uh, all these uh, hype that we are giving to Vox, that they deserve, by the way. I mean, they, had, they, they got uh, 12 seats in the, in the Andalusian parliament, which is, which is pretty impressive. What we're going to have is the welcome to the far right in in Spain, as we uh, as as we saw in the rest of Europe, and we know what that means. It's not just taking a look at the 30s in Spain or at the dictatorship of Franco. It's a matter of what do the extreme right today ask for in Europe, which is basically anti-Europe because of the uh, sovereignty of the state. Uh, above the sovereignty of of the uh, of the European Union. Second is racism, no doubt. Third is a view of the patriotism that is that that, that sounds and looks old and ancient, uh, and and that's that's what we have. Uh, we have to tell them, welcome, Ivan. You are very welcome. We are in a democracy in which uh, in which you can even go against the system as we know it, against the Constitution as we know it right now. But uh, <laughs> we will have to fight. We will have right. to fight uh, uh, peacefully, of course, but we will have to fight against the extreme right, which is already in Spain, uh, in, in our electoral system. Ivan? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, apparently, uh, Mrs. Castro and Mr. Roy are much older than me because they keep uh, talking about Franco. Franco has been there for 43 years. Uh, most of us at Vox are in their mid-40s or early 40s. We weren't even born yet when Franco died. We have no recollection, no memory. Uh, they must have suffered a lot under Castro, under Franco, I mean. Um, see, the difference between what we're saying and what they're saying is uh, Luis is accusing us of being patriotic. And I don't think that accusation would fly in any other part of the world. Um, and I wish you no, wouldn't no, play these Franco sorry, images. I say, sorry to interrupt I, I wish no, you no, wouldn't no, play no, playing say, these no, Franco no. images I, say, I speak, but this has no, nothing to do with it. I didn't say now, that you are patriotic. the difference that between patriotism I, what I and said, nationalism... Ivan, sorry, what Luis, I said I've, is I've that you have another conception of patriotism. I wish you would remain silent for one minute. But don't lie, don't lie, sorry. The lefts and the separatists seem to be very nervous with Vox. And you're right to be nervous, because the party you've been advising, Luis, which has been governing for 40 years... The far right. Go ahead. I'll, should, I, should I just leave, or, or may I intervene okay. in this? So, show? Okay. No, no, what I said. Okay. Yes, okay. Thank you very okay. much. No, so what listen, I said, Luis. What I said is uh, certainly. Yeah. So, certainly, Sorry. you said you said their interpretation of patriotism. Let's park that off. Obviously. And, and he says they are nervous. Okay. Now finish your point, Ivan. Go ahead. If I may have a couple of minutes, not as much as they're speaking, but maybe a couple of minutes. The socialist regime has been governing in Andalusia for forty years. It is no doubt the most corrupt regime in the history of Spain and potentially the most corrupt in the history of Europe. By the way, number two most corrupt regime in the history of Spain and Europe is no doubt the Catalan regime espoused by Mr. Pujol. And all this nationalism from Catalonia, which has been sort of in the background, is only coming up now because Mr. Pujol started being investigating for corruption a few years ago. And ever since that happened, we've seen this resurgence of nationalism, extremism, extremism and really just separatism, which is extremely racist. Now, Back to Vox. Vox is a legitimate party. What we say is within the realms of the Constitution, not like the government that is now being uh, supported by separatist groups, uh, former terrorist groups, 
and nationalists or uh, uh, separatists who want to break up Spain okay. and are trying to do that in an illegal way. Well, certainly, Spanish now, unity the, is a big thing The reason thing why we know that it's been illegal. Yes. Ivan, can I come the in? Way, I'm the out reason of time. why we know it's illegal. Yeah, I'm out of time. I'm totally out of time. But listen, can I ask you all a favor? Can I bring you all back onto the show for a longer conversation? Would you all agree to that? Because I'd really appreciate it. Absolutely. That. We're going to set it up Hopefully and I'd appreciate some it. Respect <laughs> Certainly. Ivan, Elizabeth, and Luis. From Vox. I appreciate Thank it. You Thanks for so much us. for joining us on the Newsmakers. We believe there is sufficient basis to bring international criminal proceedings against the perpetrators of this violence and recommend that the international community pursue legal accountability for the atrocity crimes committed in the Rakhine State against the Rohingya. The Public International Law and Policy Group and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum both came out this week calling Myanmar's violence against the Rohingya a genocide. They called on world powers to prevent further atrocities. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, is the international body with arguably the most influence over Myanmar. But during its summit last month, delegates stopped short of officially condemning Myanmar's actions. Rohingya activists say ASEAN is shielding Myanmar's de facto leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, and the country's generals from criminal prosecution. So is ASEAN failing to protect an ethnic minority in one of its member states? To discuss this, we're joined now by Maung Zani. He is the coordinator of the Free Rohingya Coalition and a fellow with the Genocide Documentation Center of Cambodia. Good to have you on Thank the Newsmakers you. again. And in Manila, we have Tom Villarin. He's a Filipino congressman and a member of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights. Gentlemen, thanks again. Maung Zani. ASEAN met in Singapore last month. They had a chat. They came out with a statement. Tell me why it wasn't good enough for you. Well, ASEAN has a genocide that the UN fact-finding mission described as still ongoing. And, uh, you know, this has been going on f in terms of the violent aspect for the last six years since 2012. In terms of structural persecution of the Rohingya, it has been going on for 40 years. You've got, you are a reg the regional organization with 10 member states, including Burma or Myanmar. You have a, a genocide in your backyard, mm -hmm. and all you could do is this, like, you know, um, a non-binding statement. Right. And so it's complete failure. And this failure is in keeping with ASEAN and its traditional whitewashing genocide. Going back to 1979, Khmer Rouge, uh, the genocide. ASEAN helped whitewash that genocide. Okay, so Tom Villarin, right? Why is ASEAN so spineless? You have the UN report in August that comes out. It uses the word genocide. It's not just activists like Mong Zani using the word genocide. You have the Holocaust Memorial Museum using the word genocide. And then ASEAN comes out and says, oh, we're deeply concerned about what's going on. And we ask Myanmar to investigate itself, essentially. That's hopeless, isn't it? Well, I think the ASEAN leaders have failed uh, the Rohingya people and, of course, uh, the ASEAN peoples. No? Because, uh, as we all know, that the situation in the region, like here in the Philippines, our president is himself caught up with uh, the possibility of being charged with uh, with crimes against humanity because of his drug war that has uh, killed more than 20,000 Filipinos. No? So we have a situation in the region right now that our leaders no, are not in the best position, nor in a moral position to criticize what's happening in Myanmar. No? And uh, precisely because of these uh, leaders no, who are in themselves uh, dictators and uh, fascists, no, to say the least, no, uh, is reflective of a bigger problem uh, in the region. But, but uh, this, these are challenges that uh, right. ASEAN leaders face. Okay, so let me go to Mang. Mang. ASEAN can't really fiddle and can't look inward because once you start with one, you have to start with all and then it will be a big, hot mess. Do you accept that argument? Yes, because just about every ASEAN member state uh, has skeletons in their closet, you know. And so they, they would not want to open um, the, uh, this issue of uh, criminality mm -hmm. that one of their member states is committing up. And, but also, I think like... Uh, ASEAN is ideologically completely flawed in the sense that uh, 
ASEAN has never front-loaded the rights and well-being of the human uh, in, uh, individuals, 500 millions of us living in the region, mm. uh, it, is, it has been, in fact, known as a club of autocrats. If you look at 10 member states, with the exception of Malaysia and Indonesia, the rest are autocratic states run by cronies right. and mafia-like regimes. Is it simple for me, and maybe I should ask this to Tom. Tom, is it too simplistic for me to see it as well? If you look at it, it might be the one group of states who happen to be Muslim-majority countries feel more sympathy for the Rohingya because they're Muslims, so they're going to push a bit more, and the others don't care as much, and they're more worried about their business partner, Myanmar, that's coming from the cold, and they don't want to upset them. Is it that simple? No, I, I don't think we should see it uh, more as just as a religious issue, but uh, it's a humanity, it's a crisis of humanitarian proportion, proportion and all ASEAN peoples, regardless of race or religion, should be concerned and, and make uh, not just a statement, but also to seek uh, uh, the interventions needed by their own governments. No? So even mm -hmm. for us in the Philippines, while we do have uh, uh, Muslims in the southern Philippines, no, we also feel no, what's right. happening in Kenya, not just because uh, uh, what's happening also in the Philippines is also a cause of concern, for the ASEAN region. So we should look at it from the perspective of the ASEAN peoples. C certainly. And that's how I think people would want these governments to look at it. But again, just looking at the facts, the Muslim majority countries being a bit harsher when it comes to their talk about Myanmar and the others not saying anything. Is there something to that, Mo? No, that's not necessarily true because, Tell you know, in, in Indonesia, um, has been uh, one of the most reluctant members of the uh, OIC right. when it comes to Burma issue because Indonesia itself has uh, economic uh, the, the, uh, interest in Burma. Money like, over uh, brotherhood. Yeah, exactly. And mm. also, like, you Got know, th there are four major, um, major investors in Burma, uh, uh, leading, uh, the, you know, the, the leader of the pack is China and followed by uh, Thailand and Singapore and Hong Kong. Right. But Hong Kong's not part of it. But, but on the question of, like, you know, uh, the, the the Muslim countries pushing this issue f farther uh, th than any other the rest of the um, ASEAN pack. That's not true because if you look at 1979 genocide, at the time ASEAN original members were only four of them, mm -hmm. and uh, the Buddhist majority, uh, the Cambodian majority, were Buddhist. They were uh, decimated. Uh, uh, Thirty percent of the population was decimated by the Khmer Rouge mm -hmm. communist regime, and in those days, like uh, Singapore was leading the effort to whitewash Khmer Rouge regime, post facto genocide, and the United States and United Kingdom seated Khmer Rouge at the Security Council, sorry, at the uh, UN General mm -hmm. Assembly as the sole representative. Okay. So this is not, okay. not about re religion. Okay. This is about human and beings. And it's good that you bring in that hu historical yeah. context. Just once again, looking at what came out of Singapore, when they said they want the Independent Commission of Inquiry, which was established by Myanmar's government to carry out an independent and impartial investigation of the allegations of human rights violations and related issues and hold those responsible fully accountable. In and of itself, nobody can disagree with that when you say, well, listen, we want accountability, we want responsibility. Do you accept, given the shackles of geopolitics and how these institutions are, that that's the best you're going to get from ASEAN as things stand? Well, I think that the ASEAN has to like uh, look forward uh, rather than being stuck in this geopolitics. Uh, yeah. And also like, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi and the Burmese military have set up at least half, half a dozen inquiries. You know, like, it's like asking uh, uh, Nazi SS to look into the crimes of, um, uh, the, you know, uh, the genocide committed against the Jews at Auschwitz and other places. Look, I mean, the fact is, we do not need any more facts. You know, I, I was the, one of the, uh, the first, uh, the very first academic authors who let, look at this issue and, and published a peer review article four years ago saying this is genocide. Right. Four out of five acts of genocide have been committed with the intent to destroy this community. Th that is what has been repeated. Study after study, at least the six studies from Yale University, like Queen Mary University in London, now Holocaust study, uh, Holocaust right. Museum. And then so we don't need any more facts. What we need is action. And ASEAN is failing intellectually, ideologically, and morally. Okay, so Tom Villarin, 
if ASEAN's been a failure on this particular issue, maybe it's good for other things in the region. But when it comes to the human rights of those Rohingya people suffering at the hands of Buddhist nationalists and Myanmar's military and so on, does it need to be somebody else who steps in? Some other transnational body, but definitely not ASEAN. Is that the reality? Uh, ASEAN could still try, no? because uh, this is the biggest uh, crisis that faced the regional bloc since its founding in 1967. And we cannot just set this aside. No? And we have also to make our own leaders no, accountable for what's happening in Rohingya. No? So, so ASEAN should not say that uh, we can't handle this uh, crisis because precisely it's happening in its own backyard. No? China might be there, India might put pressure, or Bangladesh, uh, mm -hmm. other countries outside the region can put pressure. But ASEAN, no, as a regional bloc, uh, should confront this head on no? and, and not just uh, say that it cannot do something because this will make or break uh, the regional bloc. No? Because ASEAN also has to rate, relate with international bodies. Uh, it has commitments with the international community. And doing nothing no, with regards to Rohingya will really uh, affect no, the, the standing of ASEAN. No? So countries like Singapore, no? Singapore also has this moral uh, accountability because business, I mean, the Rohingya generals and some of uh, the top officials who are doing this genocide no, put mm -hmm. their money in the banks of Singapore. So, so pressure must also be uh, put no, on specific countries as well as the regional bloc. Listen, gentlemen, I have to move on, but it's been a pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. Tom S. Villarin from the Philippines and Mang Zani, good to have you on the show once again. Thank you. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.